Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ahkam SOS, the show that discusses Islamic duties and practices. MashaAllah, it is another day of Ramadan, another fast almost achieved, inshaAllah. Uh, to all the brothers and sisters, inshallah, you're reaping the benefits of Ramadan, reaping the benefits of fasting, and inshallah, I, I pray that all your amal and all your hajat are accepted, inshallah. I'm your host, Mosin Shah, and joining me is Sheikh Ali Ma. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you this evening? Alhamdulillah, fine. MashaAllah, Sheikh. Now we've had many, you know, long discussions on different you know, topics uh, in regards to Ramadan. Inshallah, let's continue our discussion. And the first question I have for you is that if someone he's unaware if he's actually you know able to fast or not, um, is it okay for him to fast on the grounds that he spoke to a doctor or a nurse or a professional, um, and they've kind of like said yes, you're you're okay to fast, you may fast. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين. Um, yes, it's permissible for him to follow the instructions of the doctor who's a trustworthy, who's an expert in this field. He knows uh, the situations of the fasting and so forth related to uh, the fasting. Um, yes, he can follow his guidance in terms of fasting or not fasting. That should be fine. And it doesn't matter if the doctor is like a non-Muslim or, or if it's a Muslim. It, is that, does that have an effect? Of course, the non-Muslim doctor, if he knows what the fasting of, of the Muslims is uh, in terms of, you know, refraining from eating and drinking from the dawn till dusk, then if he knows, then that's fine. He can oh. still uh, yeah, follow his guidance. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Also, Shekhan, when it comes to, you know, medical conditions, a lot of our brothers and sisters, uh, they want to fast. Um, but they have to take injections in their, in their normal life. So does the use of any kind of injection, um, maybe it's nourishing or, or saline, uh, and it's, uh, anesthetics or, or medicinal, uh, maybe it's insulin for di diabetics, are we allowed to use these injections and continue our fast? Yes, um, I mean, these injections would not invalidate the fast. The fast will remain uh, um, uh, valid and, and sahih, even though the one took these uh, injections while he was fasting. Okay, and maybe, I mean, uh, we probably have to refer back to a marja. There probably are some maraja out there who say no, it does invalidate the fast, but according to a uh, majority or according to Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi, it doesn't invalidate the fast. You're more than welcome to uh, use the injection. Is that correct? Yes, in order, the, the ulama would. Uh, Basically, when they say that these types of uh, injections uh, won't break the fast, because these injections, basically, the evidence is that uh, if you eat or drink uh, from the normal, you know, as we see with, uh, for example, through the mouth, sometimes through the nose, where you have the, if somebody, uh, you know, drops of water, for example, goes through the nose, for example, and reaches the throat. Mm -hmm. um, so the normal is to eat and drink through the mouth. And injection is not one of the uh, methods or ways in which the one can easily call it a subject of eat or, or drink. Mm. So that's why they would uh, allow for uh, the injections, whatever injections they are, for, for, for nourishment, yes. for, uh, for vitamins and so forth, because they're not uh, subject to, um, in, in terms of, uh, eating or drinking, so it's just a d different subject. Ascent, ascent, um, wow, well, didn't think of it like that. <laughs> Sheikhna, according to our grand marja, um, Ayatollah Sheikh Wahid Khorsani, uh, who is in, in Iran, uh, does the use of nose drops break the fast? Yes, uh, his eminence and other maraja would also uh, mention that if the drop, the, the, the drop which is uh, poured through the nose reaches the throat, the halq, then it will break the fast. So it depends. If it's just a normal nose drop, it doesn't reach the, 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 the throat, that's fine. But if it reaches, then it will invalid and breaks the fast. 
Wow, didn't think about that. So injections are allowed, but nose drops aren't allowed. A quick reminder to all our viewers is that we are taking your live questions. If you have a question you'd like to ask us, you can send it via, via the WhatsApp or you can send it via email address. Alternatively, you can even call us live on the show right now. Um, give us a call and me and the Sheikh will be more than happy to discuss your question, inshallah. Sheikhna, um, if a person presumes that fasting harms him, so they're assuming that it, you know it's, it's not good for them, and he develops a fear from the presumption, is it obligatory for him to fast? So um, I'm not... I don't think I can fast because of whatever medical condition or something. And then um, from that, I'm actually quite scared of my health. I actually know, you know what, uh, I'm not very well. Um, you know, it's Corona right now. Corona is very, very high. Everyone's in, in, in you know, self-isolating. That shock or that, you know, uh, assumption that's being manifested inside that person. Um, is it obligatory for that person to fast or to actually to stop and not to fast? If it's actually a serious matter, a genuine matter in terms of in a, a genuine fear and harm, expected harm, then he's not allowed to fast. And if he fasts, then it would be invalid. Batal. So th those who have an illness, let's say diabetes, and it is one of those uh, severe diabetes, and they try to fast, but they know that it's going to harm them. There's a possibility of harming them then they're not allowed to fast, and if they do so, the fast will be battered. Shaka, what about the opposite way? So what if someone didn't have any fear of, of fasting and was fine uh, and fasted, and then Maghrib time they discovered that actually fasting has harmed my body. Um, so that person will probably no longer fast, but for that day, do they have to make the qada of that fast, or is it okay that that fast is counted? No, he's not obliged to make it up later and do ghada because he fasted from the Fajr till Maghrib yes. with no uh, side effects and any conditions of illness. So that should be fine. Okay. Shaykh, I've got an email here that's coming. Just bear with me. I live in two cities. The distance between is approximately 23 kilometers. I live for two days in one of them and five days in the other every week. Am I considered as a traveler? And I am a muqallid of uh, the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Saeed Al-Hakim. So someone uh, has, you know, is constantly traveling between two cities, 23 kilometers apart. Uh, looks like it's a regular one. Um, two days in one location, five days in another. According to Sayyid Hakim, um, am I considered a traveler? Um, initially, if these two locations are his or her hometowns, then of course the one needs to complete his uh, salah in full and also fast the holy month of Ramadan. So whenever he goes to this location or the other location, which is uh, hometowns, because you have Watan or, or hometown number one yes. and Watan or hometown number two. So they are both mm -hmm. your hometowns. Yeah. Uh, so you have to complete your salah and fast as well when you are there in both locations. Um, but let's say that uh, he was given a project for a one or two months in the second place, second location, mm -hmm. and he traveled from his hometown to that place, as you've mentioned, two days a week or something. Um, in this case, this is not considered to be as uh, a frequent or, or kathir al safar, uh, a frequent traveler. So he needs also to, uh, in this case, to uh, uh, break his, his fast and pray shorten as well because he is not in such a journey of uh, kathir al-safar because only w one month, let's say, contract, six weeks contract, and he comes back home again. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, it's not considered as to be uh, a second hometown. I see. I see. I think. Um, you know, I just uh, <laughs> something came to my mind was that in, in, when you go for ziyara in Karbala, uh, you have the the option of doing Qasr or Fu. And I was thinking that maybe, you know, Karbala, the holy city, may be a hometown for everybody, inshallah, one day, we, we'll see. Shaykhna, pregnant ladies and ladies who have just given birth, um, you know, when, when it comes to fasting, um, especially ladies who are breastfeeding children. Now, if we, you and I both understand the importance of breastfeeding, um, if 
Ramadan has come and a lady feels that they won't be able to produce enough milk for their child due to fasting, is she allowed to, um, you know, abstain from fasting? Um, also, we do have powdered milk available. There's many, many different types of baby milks available. Um, so maybe she could, uh, you know, substitute the breast milk for, you know, milk off the shelf. Is that okay? Is that acceptable to do? Or, you know, should she not fast and give natural milk? Or should she fast and, you know, breastfeed the child? Well, it is permissible for her not to fast in this condition. And usually the ulam would allow for the pregnant and breastfeeding woman not to fast. Um, even if it takes them the second Ramadan as well. So the first she was pregnant, the second she was yes. breastfeeding. So she yeah. can easily miss two, two. two months of Ramadan consecutively and uh, not to fast. Um, but of course, the ahkam of paying fidya and um, if they can do um, um, the qada and so forth. But for now, I mean, she's allowed not to fast. I mean, it's, it's okay. And she doesn't need to go and get the milk from the shelves or the phone okay. milk, for example. She can still give her child uh, the, uh, the breast milk. Okay, so she's uh, she's exempted from from fasting. Exactly. And inshallah, we'll have a, we'll have another show and discussion on those who are exempted from fasting. Inshallah, um, Sheikhna, is it permissible um, for people who are not fasting? So they have legitimate reasons. Maybe you know they exempt because they're traveling. They exempt because they ill. They exempt because they're pregnant or, or so forth. But, uh, are they allowed to eat and drink in public, which is in a way, you know, breaching um, you know, the sanctity of the holy month of Ramadan? Um, if this is considered as the breach of the sanctity, as as you mentioned, of the holy month of Ramadan, then this is not allowed for them to consume food and drink in public. Imagine somebody who is, let's say, musafir or ill. And they are exempted from fasting, and they come in the streets or in the, in the you know, uh, local parks, for example, publicly eat and drink. That's going to actually breach the sanctity of this holy month. They're not allowed. Okay. Wow. So best thing is to get a takeaway and go home. And exactly. Eat those. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. Sheikhla, uh, we've got a question in here from from an email, and it is regarding a sister. I am a married woman and my husband is of another sect. Um, he requests that I break my fast and have iftar in accordance to his Maghrib sunset, which is actually 15 minutes before our Maghrib prayer. Can I break my fast with him? I am a Mukallid of uh, Ayatollah Sayyid Sistani. So we here have a Mukallid of Sayyid Sistani who is married to um, an individual who does not open their fast at the Shia timings, uh, but earlier, 15 minutes earlier, um, her husband is instructing her to also open a fast with him. Is she allowed to do so, according to Ayatollah Sistani? Well, Ayatollah Sistani mentions, and all the, some other maraja as well, uh, that as an obligatory precaution, ihtiyat um, wujubi, that as long as the redness in the eastern sky, which appears after the sunset, has mm -hmm. not passed overhead because uh, how come we, I mean, what is the sign in, in which we start to pray the Maghrib, the, the sign, yes. the, Maghrib, the Shari Maghrib, is the when, uh, after the sunset, sunset, and mm -hmm. then you look up after 10-15 minutes, where you see the redness of the sky, the eastern side, is That's on cool. top of your head. Mm -hmm. That is actually renders the time of the uh, Salat al-Maghrib, and Isha and Iftar as well. Mm -hmm. So as long as this is not passed over the head, um, she's not allowed to break her fast. She must wait at least, as I've said, 15, 20 minutes mm -hmm. um, until the Maghrib Shari is yes. achieved. Ascent. Ascent. So um, there's no, um, as we say, like room for leniency here. You know, Maghrib time is Maghrib time, and what's prescribed is the time to actually open your fast. Um, I think this goes also for others who. Um, I remember at university we tried to you know open fast together all the different types of Muslims, uh, but for we we Shia we, we didn't we used to wait um, we'd sit there with them and we you know we'd allow them to open their fast but we'd wait until our time and when our time came we would eat and break fast 
So I, I think it's very important to have understanding, but as well as, you know, some sort of um, you know, realization as well and acceptance that we open our fast at the prescribed time for ourselves. Sheikhla, um, does giving blood samples in hospitals for the purpose of tests invalidate the fast? <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't break the fast in terms of, you know, giving blood mm-hmm. as donation or uh, in terms of blood test. That should be fine. Okay. I think uh, I wouldn't advise someone to do it, though, considering, you know, you, your blood sugar levels, your blood salt levels are quite low anyway, and then you're going to take blood out. But, alhamdulillah, fiki wise um, there's no issue with actually um, donating blood uh, for donations or whether it's for a blood test as well. Um, Sheikh, now, according to his eminence, the Grand Ayatollah says Sistani, um, if a fasting person goes to a place where he knows something will be forced down his throat or where he'll be forced to break his fast, is he allowed to go to such a place while fasting? Well, such individual, he shouldn't go to such places. If he knew that they will basically uh, force him to break his fast for any reason, um, you know, he, he'll become compelled to do so. So he's not allowed basically to go to such a place in which it will invalid his fast. Why should he go there? So don't go from the first place. So if he did so, and he knew that, his fast becomes, of course, invalid and batal. So he needs to retake the fast. Wow. And we also also have to consider if there's a kafar or not, because it's some kind of some kind of deliberate yeah. uh, breaking the fast. So is there a kafar? We have to see that from the Sayyid as well to see if he says if there's a kafar or there's no kafar. Sent mm-hmm. Shayna, we mentioned uh, donating blood. Um, let's take it a bit further and say that what if someone goes under full um, you know, anesthetic process before an operation? Um, does that invalidate the fast? So, first of all, sorry, first of all, uh, before an operation, you are instructed not to eat anything anyway, uh, normally 24 hours beforehand. So, let's say one person is already in a state of fasting because they haven't eaten anything. So they haven't eaten anything, they probably are fasting right now. And then on top of that, um, you know, they go for an operation, and they, they get an anesthetic. Does this invalidate the fast or not? Um, and let's see what Sayyid um, Al-Hakim has to say about this. Um, yes, he would mention that his fast would not be valid. And oh. I think I mentioned some time ago one of the uh, types of invalidators of fast, mutalat mm-hmm. of fast, is when somebody goes to un- unconsciousness yeah. um, and uh, he loses, he faints, and you know he mm-hmm. loses in terms of uh, awareness. And, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's one of the mutalat. Of course, there are different opinions between the ulama. Ayatollah Shirazi says that, for example, if this happened between uh, Salat al Dhuhr, so let's say this happened just minutes before Salat al-Dhuhr, and then now we have Adhan al-Dhuhr, and he woke oh. up after Salat al-Dhuhr, then the fast will be void and batil. So, oh, before and after that, that should be fine. But some other, know, as the Sayyid mentions here as well, that no, it would be not be valid. So, it depends on who you follow to see where in which um, timings uh, this will make the uh, fast invalid. I see, I see. Uh, interesting, because I, I know sleeping doesn't invalidate the fast, and technically you are unconscious, but fainting and, and losing consciousness does. So it's an interesting topic. Um, Sheikhna, for those who have passed away, so if one's parents have died, um, who is obliged to perform the qada of their salah and fasting if they had any? Well, the one who is responsible to, uh, and, and as a mandatory, as a wajib, to do the qada of his deceased parents is the eldest son. Mm-hmm. Um, he is obliged to do the qada. Of course, if they have not missed the, the, the prayers and the fasting in disobedience, in other words, let's say you have some parents, they are not religious. You've seen them, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. The, the, the children are, are religious, subhanAllah. The parents are not religious. Yeah. So you see the mother is not, no, has no hijab. The father, for example, he doesn't pray, he doesn't fast for the entire of his life. Mm-hmm. And he dies. No, the ones that you have to do the qada 
is the ones who they actually used to pray, but uh, unused to fast. But things happened, they couldn't actually uh, do the salah or, or fast, mm-hmm. let's say. Let's say they died in a trip, in a holiday, and they had qada of, because they traveled, they had to break their fast. They have to come back and do the qada, yes. but they died. Mm-hmm. Now we have to do the qada of those days in which they couldn't make it, up yes, because yes. They, they passed away afterwards, for example. Mm-hmm. So um, it really depends uh, if the parents were actually uh, diso- disobedient in, towards the uh, ahkam Allah Azza wa Jalla, or they were obedient, but they left the world uh, without doing the qada of some of their ibadat. Shana, is it permissible to actually hire someone to do the qada of all these duties of the deceased? Yes, of course, you can hire somebody, pay them to do the qada, that's fine. Even if somebody volunteers, let's say your friend, your neighbor, and they want to do, they get the ajr and rewards, they are allowed to take the, these wajibat duties mm-hmm. and do the qada of your parents or uh, grandparents, whoever you had from the disease. That, that should be fine. Uh, thank you very much, Sheikhna. Um, final, we've got a final question, but I just wanted to let the brothers and sisters know that if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please send them to the WhatsApp, the email address, or you can call in. Uh, you know, the number's right over there in the corner. I think it's this corner over here somewhere. She would see a number. Uh, but um, like I said, our final question is actually from the WhatsApp. So I wanted to encourage uh, all the viewers that please, please, if you have any questions on any topic in regards to Islamic law, it is an honor for myself and also the Sheikh to go and research and find the answers for yourselves. Um, Sheikh, now final question, and it's from the WhatsApp. Uh, I am going to marry uh, with a recently reverted Christian girl. Since she doesn't understand Arabic, can I recite the nikah marriage contract in English? Uh, I am also a muqallid of Sayyid Sistani. So here we have a, I'm assuming this is a Muslim man uh, who is going to marry a recently reverted girl, uh, Christian girl towards uh, the path of the Ahlul Bayt She doesn't understand Arabic properly They're getting married Is it okay for the marriage contract to be recited in English So that she could understand According to Ayatollah Sistani um, Yes His eminence mentions that As a precaution You know um, That the one should uh, Recite the Nikah contract or the marriage contract In Arabic And it doesn't suffice if it was uh, recited or read in any other languages so the one should as a precaution uh, recite uh, the, the uh, marriage contract mm-hmm. in Arabic language or you can give the wakala to somebody else to the Mulana, for example somebody who knows about marriage and, and divorces he actually does the uh, all the process of marriage contract by taking uh, your wakala on behalf of you, and then that should be fine in this case. Ahsan, thank you so much, Sheikhna, for your time and for your efforts. And thank you to all the viewers for joining us. We do understand that it is difficult now to actually watch us on Skype and that we're not in our normal studio in, in uh, London. But um, inshallah, as soon as you know the, the quarantine is finished and the government allows us, we will be back in our studios doing our live shows there. So thank you for being patient with us and thank you to continue supporting our channel and continuing to support uh, Ahkam SOS. Inshallah, we'll see you guys tomorrow at 6.30 here on Imam Hussein TV3. Um, my name is Mohsin Shah. <laughs> that is Sheikh Ali Marsh. Inshallah, we'll see you tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.